Good morning, I am Kenny Polcurry, your host of the party, and today is Monday, June 13th, 2022, and what a day it is setting up to be. So what is it? Here are the things that you need to know, right? What happened on Friday? We had that really hot, or hotter than expected, consumer price index report, right? So I say, danger, Will Robinson, danger. CPI hits a 41-year high. The Fed is now backed into a very tiny corner as the walls begin to cave in. Everything is up, and gas is now above $5 a gallon across the country on average, Crypto's getting crushed as well. Bitcoin down 11% today. Ethereum's down 17% today. And the other lesser known ones are down even more. Treasury prices getting slammed, sending yields higher as investors reprice the risk of owning stocks as the recession looms large over the country and more likely the global economy. And what do we have for dinner tonight? Well, considering what's going on, it's time to break out the fried bologna sandwich. We'll get to that in a minute. Rising prices continuing to hammer stocks and bonds and investor psyche. Worries that surging inflation will now force the Fed into more drastic action as is what sent the algos into overdrive, initiating waves of sell order after sell order as they trampled over each other in an effort to get out. Buyers, on the other hand, were happy to let prices decline, stepping back to avoid getting run over in an effort to uh, shake out the weakness, right? Shake the branches a little bit, allowing stocks to reprice as we move into what is sure to be a much more aggressive Fred, uh, Fed posture. Friday's stronger than expected CPI report showed inflation running at an 8.6% annual rate, up three-tenths of a percent over last month and well ahead of what the expectation was, along with plummeting consumer confidence. That number came in at 50.2, down from 58.4, a dramatic move for sure. Traders, uh, algos, and some investors decided that enough was enough, and now is the time to just get out, which is usually one of the signs of pending capitulation, when everyone gets so anxious that they throw everything out the window, including the kitchen sink. Now, just to be clear, that hasn't happened yet, but it feels like it's getting closer. So could it be today? Maybe the way futures are setting up. As the morning turned to afternoon on Friday, stocks got weaker and weaker, closing on their lows again. Recall that they did that on Thursday evening. And on Friday morning, I told you that was not usually a good sign. That when stocks or indexes close on their lows, it usually means that they're about to test lower on the next trading day, which is exactly what they did on Friday. So now the question is, will they rinse and repeat again today? And apparently the answer to that question is a resounding yes, at least right now, as futures got crushed overnight and are all pointing significantly lower this morning. So you can feel how that's just setting up, right? And, and ultimately what we're going to need is that capitulation to happen. At 5 a.m., Dow futures were lower by 600 points, which is actually up from being down 900 points at 2 o'clock. S&Ps are down 90, the NASDAQ lowered by another 350 points, and the Russell was off 46 points. Stocks in Japan and Hong Kong and Taiwan and South Korea all down more than 3% uh, overnight. And markets in Europe are all lowered by greater than 2% as the sun makes its way across the European sky. By the closing bell on Friday, investors and traders were a little less wealthy as stocks got slammed. The Dow giving up a whopping 880 points or 2.7 percent. The S&P lost 117 or 3 percent. The Nasdaq gave up 415 points or three and a half percent. The Russell lost 51 points or 2.7 percent and the transports gave back 380 points or 2.6 percent. All this as rising energy and food costs surge beyond 41 year highs with gas at the pump now more than $5 a gallon across the nation. That's the average, right? So there's higher and there's lower, but the average is just over five. Declines across the board in everything suggests that investors now expect JJ to change his tune once again. And while Wednesday this week promises to bring us 50 basis points, there's already talk that that may change as well. That the realization that inflation is spiraling out of control may force the Fed to surprise markets by raising rates by 75 bips on Wednesday, which in my opinion would not be a smart thing to do at this late hour. 
Why? Because they've set it up for weeks now, telling us 50 basis points is the move over and over and over again, suggesting that they had it under control. So a sudden change on Wednesday would suggest that they have lost complete control and that they have lost all credibility as well. It would be equivalent to them screaming, fire! Now that they've done that, uh, now, that does not mean that the narrative is not going to change for July, September, November, and December, as I suspect it most likely will. Tomorrow we do to get the monthly producer price index, right? The PPI report. And that is supposed to suggest that all prices at the producer level are dropping. That's what they want you to believe. The estimate is for year-over-year -year demand of 10.8%, which would be down from 11% last month. Now, I think that's very funny. And by the way, full of baloney. My gut tells me that it's at least 11%, and I would not be surprised if it was higher as well, just like the CPI. So brace yourself. And then on Wednesday, you're going to get the results of the June Fed meeting. And at 2.30, the press conference, which should reveal what JJ and his team thinks. And it cannot be good, no matter what they say, how they try to propose it. It can't be good. How can it? So now you have to ask, is he going to attempt to downplay Friday's spike in CPI and try to blow smoke up your, uh, well, you fill in the blank, or will he wake up and smell the roses? Will he come out and say that everything is on the table, including intermeeting hikes? And if, that, uh, uh, and if he does, what does that really say about what the Fed heads are thinking? Because in any event, investors, traders, and algos are smelling the roses, and guess what? They do not like the way they smell. Talk of 75 base points and now a 1% rate increase in the months ahead are now legitimately part of the narrative. They have to be. The Fed would be considered illegitimate if, they did, if that did not become part of the narrative. In light of everything that's going on, it absolutely has to be. And the possibility that it happens in June is only adding angst to the, to the, to the environment. Now, that's going to surely push us into a recession as if we're not already there and deeper into bear market territory. The only question now is how deep will we get pushed? How much pain is the Fed willing to impose? And again, isn't it comical that we're charging the very people that put us in this position to get us out? I mean, the Fed is responsible for at least 75% of what's going on. Why? Because they stimulated too long, they completely missed the mark, and all the signs back in the spring of 2021. The Biden administration's ongoing stimmy checks and the Build Back Better plan added the next 23%. And then Putin's 2% contribution has pushed inflation uh, rates to levels not seen since the early 80s. Now, to be crystal clear, Putin is not at the root cause of this level of inflation. It's been building for years and it has now come home to roost. So get that whole idea that this is Putin's war, Putin's inflation, it's baloney. The 10-year Treasury surged at 3.16%, up from 3.02. And this morning, it's up another 7 bips at 3.23, as the bond buyers are nowhere in sight. Plunging bond prices, sending yields higher, only begin to tell the story of what is to come. Because remember, the Fed has been the buyer of last resort for years now. And, they're, and, and now that they're really beginning to raise rates and reduce the balance sheet by $45 billion this month, soon to be $95 billion per month starting in August, do not expect them to be standing in place supporting the bond market the way they have been doing it for years. So then you cannot expect institutional buyers to just stand there and get run over. Oh, no, 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 no. Just like stocks, bond buyers are choosing to bid lower, as they should. Remember, the Fed is no longer holding their hand, either on the bond side or the stock side, right? So prices are going to have to adjust. And with every increase in Fed funds, you can expect the stock buyers and bond buyers will continue to bid lower, sending yields up, up, and away, and sending stock prices lower until they find a level of stability. Of the 11 S&P broad sectors, consumer discretionary XLY led the day's losses on Friday down 4%, taking that sector down 30% year-to-date. Tech, XLK, was right behind it at minus 3.8%. Financials lost 3.6%. Basic materials lost 3%. Industrials, XLI, lost 3%. Communications, XLC, down 2.8%. Real estate, down 2.4%. Energy and healthcare, both down about 1.7%. Utilities uh, um, were the least affected, down just 8 tenths. The value trade lost 2.2%, leaving it lower by 8.5% year-to-date, while the growth trade is fell by 3.6%, leaving it down 26% year-to-date. 
As of this morning, the Dow is now down 14% year to date. The S&P down 18%, the NASDAQ down 28, the Russell off 20%, the transports are lower by 19. Oil is up 65%, food and commodity prices are up 35%, and housing costs are surging as well. All this while Jay told Jimmy Kimmel in his first interview in 150 days last week that we have the strongest economy in the world. Nothing to worry about. I must have missed that memo. I don't know about you. I clearly must have missed it. The contra trades, though, continue to do well, as you would expect. The dog, which gets you short the Dow, gained 2.8%. The PSQ gets you short the NASDAQ, was up 3.5%. The SH gets you short the S&P, that gained 3%. These three trades are now up 13%, 30%, 18%, respectively, year-to-date. And the VIXI, which gets you long the fear index, gained 6% on Friday, was up 25% last week, and is looking to spike higher again today. This morning, it's up another 17%, trading at 32.80, with many suggesting that 40 is the level to watch and will signal the start of real capitulation, which will see indiscriminate selling of everything across the board, and that's when you know it's time. Oil ended the day on Friday at $120.50 a barrel after testing as high as $122.50 and as low as $118.50. Confusion over what the data reveals sent oil on this wild ride. Many now asking, will inflation kill the goose that laid the golden egg in 2022 or is it everyone just overreacting? The energy ETF XLE is up 65% year to date, mimicking the rise in oil. This morning, oil is under a little bit of pressure down two bucks a barrel as China reimposes lockdowns once again on another COVID alert. Beijing demanding that in dining at restaurants close their doors and after 35 new cases are reported in, Beijing, in uh, Shanghai, causing Beijing to demand another round of mass testing for millions of Chinese citizens. Seems to me that Xi Xi just doesn't get it, or actually maybe he does. Lockdowns clearly do not work to control the virus, but it does work to control the people and it does work to disrupt the global supply chain, only exacerbating the issues. Once again, another reason for us to diversify away from this communist state. If we're gonna to continue to outsource our manufacturing to Asia, then look somewhere else. Vietnam would be a place to look. In any event, it's time to move out of China, and with each and every lockdown, it only reiterates that point. This morning, U.S. futures are getting crushed again, as noted, as I told you earlier, right? There was nothing specific over the weekend to add to the eggs. It's just a realization that it's not good. Eco data today includes nothing, but tomorrow brings us the PPI report, which is expected to be hot. Wednesday brings us mortgage apps, which will surely be down again, as they have over the last six weeks. Advanced retail sales expected to be up one-tenth of a percent, with X autos and gas of up four-tenths of a percent. At 2 p.m., we're going to get the Fed decision along with the press conference at 2.30. Thursday brings us housing starts, expected to be down 1%. The Home Builder ETF, XHB, was off 4% on Friday, is now down 32% year-to-date. Think interest rates, industrial production is supposed to be up 4 tenths, capacity utilization of 79.2, inching ever closer to the 80% level that suggests inflationary pr pressures continue to build. Calls for the S&P 3400 by Morgan Stanley and S&P 3100 by Goldman Sachs are at the top of today's headlines as they now light the fire. Just to be clear, that would be down another 13% if Morgan's correct and down another 20% from here if Goldman is correct. This on top of the 18% that the S&P is now down as of this morning. And when the market's over, it's going to be down 20%. European markets are all down by 2 plus percent across the board. German bonds, Italian bonds, and, bank, and other benchmark sovereign bonds all trading lower, sending yields higher across the region. Last week's confirmation by the European Central Bank that they're about to start the tightening process by ending the bond buying program along with raising rates continues to set the mood. Toss in rising inflation pressures and bang, stocks and bonds will go lower until the risk profile stabilizes. And that's not true just across Europe. It's true really across the world, right? Certainly here and, and all the developed nations. The S&P closed at 3,900 on Friday, down 116 points, right on the low of the day, which usually means what? Yep, we're going to test lower today. 
I said it last year and I keep saying it again today. The Fed needed to shock the markets. They needed to stop the insanity and crush it. It won't be pretty, but guess what? It needs to happen. The question is, will he do it in an election year? Will he do it when voters are going to the polls in five months? Get ready for another volatile week, folks. PPI, the Fed, housing and advanced retail sales are all this week's storytellers. Capitulation is coming. I can feel it in my gut. The countdown has begun. Now, I've been calling for a retest of S&P 3800 for uh, a while, right? Ever since the last time it tested and bounced. Well, now it's here. The question is, will it hold? A failure to hold will cause all the algos go into another selling frenzy as another technical level gets shattered, leaving S&P 3600 as the next downside target. I'm remaining hopeful that 3800 is going to hold, but I'm setting myself up for more trouble ahead, just so I'm not super surprised. Just saying. Okay, so what do we have for dinner today? Well, considering what's going on, we're going to have fried bologna. Like, that's what I said. Fried bologna sandwiches, right? Considering the cost of food, the cost of energy, uh, and the stress that it's putting on people, it's clear to me that it's time for some bologna sandwiches and it's, it is comfort food. Uh, it's also relatively cheap to prepare. But you know what? There's a certain thing about it, right? It always makes you feel like a kid again. I mean, who didn't grow up eating fried bologna sandwiches as a kid? I mean, raise your hand if you didn't eat fried bologna sandwiches as a kid. You have to. It's just part of being a kid. Now, for this, you need butter, four slices of bologna, one slice of yellow American cheese, mustard or mayo, or maybe you're going to mix them both. Keep them separate, whatever. You need white bread, like Wonder White Bread. Lettuce and tomato if you want to be fancy. Now, start by heating up some butter in a frying pan. When it's nice and hot, add the bologna slices and let them crisp up. You know how they do, right? They get the little bubble, you pop it, you flip it over. Uh, and repeat. All while this is happening, you want to lay out two slices of the white Wonder Bread. You want to spread the mayo-mustard mix on both sides of the bread, or one or the other, whatever you're using, right? When the bologna is all crisped up, you're going to take two slices of bologna, put it on one slice of bread. Then you're going to put the cheese on. And if you're using lettuce and tomato, then you're going to add the lettuce and tomato on top of that, right? If you're not, then you're going to take the other two slices of bologna and you're going to put it right on top. And then you're going to take the other slice of bread and put that on top. Press it so it all comes together and then slice it in a diagonal so it looks pretty. You think you're fancy out at a fancy restaurant. A side of potato chips works really well with this. It's just simple. This whole meal should cost you no more than $15 to feed a family of four. Anyway, I've already gotten comments from the written note about people that saw the fried bologna sandwich and loved it. Again, reminds them of being a child. Look, brace yourself. Today's going to be another rough day. This week could actually see a lot of volatility, so uh, no time to go to sleep. Until tomorrow, take good care.